Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. It's a beautiful day that God has given us. Maybe you saw the sunrise this morning, just amazing. And uh, I hope it's been that kind of a weekend for you, a, a beautiful weekend, time to spend with family, time to spend this morning with your church family. Just want to welcome those that are in the Baker Center and those that are uh, with us online this morning. We are the gathered body of Christ. And uh, it's great for us to be able to be together this morning to proclaim that Jesus is alive and we belong to him. And so I hope that that is an encouragement to you this morning. And if you're just waking up or getting going, not sure about the day, I hope that the, uh, just the act of being here in the fellowship of your brothers and sisters will encourage you and, uh, and give you a song this morning. Speaking of which, thanks to our, our worship teams for leading us in that time of praise. We're going to continue this morning in our uh, series in First Peter. And it's been, uh, it's been amazing, it's been challenging. Hope you've been challenged by it. As we have walked through this uh, series, the, the series title is Not Our Home. That we're not at home, that we're sojourners in a place, but we're looking forward to going home to a different place. And this morning as we look at chapter four, uh, as you can see, uh, I've called the sermon, It's Time for a Change. And Peter's gonna tell us about two different perspectives on life. And we'll see what he uh, calls us to. But let me share this with you, a little personal story as we get going from my childhood. When I was in seventh grade, I think that's when I got my first personal computer. So my first home computer, do, do some of you remember back to the first computer that you brought home and where you put it and some of them made, like occupied a whole room at one time, like a mainframe system or whatever? Well, this was a, a PC Junior. My grandpa bought me a PC Junior, one of the first sort of computers sized for home use. I was in seventh grade and my grandpa did that because my grandma told him to. She said, take him out, he needs a computer for school. So get him a computer. So grandpa got me a PC Junior. Uh, perhaps you remember the old venerable PC Junior. That's what it looked like when it started. I can still hear the beep when it was booting up, you know, that tone, beep. That, those things are stuck in your head forever, like the old modems with the <laughs> all that stuff. Good days, good times. If you're younger in here, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but. Uh, Anyway, you might, I don't know if you could see this, when this thing booted up and it had the color bar, floppy disk drive, five and a quarter inch, some of you still have those in a drawer, I bet I do somewhere. It said 128 kilobytes of operating memory. Man, was that great, because the Commodore only had 64. But the PC Junior had 128 and you could buy these big console things that you could add on and they each added another 64 kilobytes of memory. So I looked, my phone, I think, has uh, eight gigabytes of operating memory, not storage, but operating memory. And if my calculations, well, if the computer told me correctly, and if I put the numbers in right, that is more than 62,000 times the operating memory of the PC Junior. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? And I, I believe it's true, you, you all can fact check me later, your phone has more operating memory and definitely more calculating capacity than the first space shuttle when it was launched. So the question is, would you take your phone to the moon? Would you ride your phone to the moon? I don't know, maybe there's an app for that, could happen. But I could do cool stuff on the PC Junior like make a calendar and I could make a task list. And if I was interested, which I was not, I could make a budget, but I didn't care about a budget in seventh grade. I could also play IBM's touchdown football, which was like the little pixelated guys that went across the screen. There were like five, five guys to a team. It was, it was pretty cool. So that was, all, that was all fun and good, but you might see a, a feature that I am getting to something here. I'm just not, just not reminiscing on nostalgia. These slots below the floppy disk drive, very interesting on the PC Junior. Didn't last long on PCs, but that was a slot for a cartridge, two slots for cartridges. They were about yay big, very lightweight. And so the PC Junior, the way it ran, if you wanted to run a software program, they came on cartridges, most of them. There wasn't a lot available to use with the disk drive. So if you wanted to, for instance, learn uh, programming in the basic language, remember basic, you had the cartridge and you would plug in the cartridge for basic and then you could go to work programming in basic. If you wanted to do something in, with word processing, you would have the word processing program on a cartridge. You pull out the basic cartridge and plug in the word processing one. And so that, that was how you put the software in and out of the machine with the PC Junior. I think I, I used it, I probably used this thing all the way up through high school for writing papers. 
and I had a, one of those dot matrix printers, you know, like, so I, I do just want to say this as a practical matter. If you are a relic hunter this way, I, I believe I still have this computer in my dad's basement. So if you want to talk to me afterwards, we can maybe do a little deal. If, you know, it's a priceless antique. But the point about the cartridges is this. We're going to see as we look at 1 Peter chapter 4 today that the perspectives on life that Peter is giving us, it's sort of like those cartridges. There's an old program that many of us have lived in and worked by and we've run in our lives. And that old cartridge, that old program has its own set of desires and attitudes and ideas and behaviors. And then there's a new program that God has given us that he wants us to run, he wants us to plug in. And that comes with its own new set of ideas and desires and habits and behaviors. And Peter's gonna contrast those two for us and show us where they lead. But I want you to keep that visual in mind of taking the old cartridge out and plugging in the new one. And here's the thing, as throughout the book, Peter has told us, if you're going to run the new program, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be some challenges ahead for you, and it, it actually can be dangerous for you. So he's going to give us that warning as we look into it. Let's read together uh, from 1 Peter chapter 4. Feel free to, to pull this up or turn to it or just follow along here if you like. Starting in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They, the pagans, are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And Peter's moved to a word of praise at the end of that section. Well, look, let's look at the first program and, and what it means really to change it. Peter walks through that. He gives a list of things. But he says this, Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because he who suffers in his body is done with sin. Appreciated Pastor Rob last week. I wasn't here, but I was able to watch it as he walked us through the end of chapter three and it talked about Christ's suffering and what it accomplished. He suffered in his body, but through that, he brought us to God. And so Peter is now saying, follow that example. Christ has been raised. All powers are in submission to him. But we, as his disciples, are to follow that example and to arm ourselves with the same attitude. So what does that mean, to arm yourself? Well, I mean, it means to get ready, right? Get ready in a serious way. Get ready because what you are going to pursue, what you're going to go through is a battle. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a fight. He's using the, the language of getting ready for a battle here. So I thought, what's the current, uh, if you're going to arm yourself, what's the current picture of what, like a U.S. Army soldier, the gear that they would be issued that they would take into combat with them? What's, what's the combat uniform here? for like regular infantrymen. And we're familiar with a lot of this. Um, obviously the helmet, very important, can turn away shrapnel, can turn away uh, certain caliber rounds from, from the head. Protective eyewear, pretty critical like, to keep your vision in order on the battlefield. And then there's some, some vision aids, maybe night vision goggles. Um, the ballistic protection, so in the, in the vest that soldiers wear, they have these plates that are designed to repel bullets and turn them away. My son can tell you a lot about this. He knows a lot more about it than I do, but that's a the defensive protection against the incoming fire. 
and the, the plates that, that you're wearing. And then, of course, the offensive, the high-powered rifle, offensive weaponry, some of the gear that, that goes along with that, gloves, protective, uh, I thought it was interesting, protective elbow pads and knee pads, going to be going through some rough terrain. Even the very camouflage outfit itself, I understand, is a fire-resistant material for extra protection. And the all-important boots. Any, any soldier who's been through it will tell you, you've got to take care of your feet or you're not going to be in the fight for long. So that's what the modern U.S. Army soldier uses when they prepare to arm themselves for the fight. And when we think about it, it's not so different, is it, than even some of the other languages of the New Testament, some of the language that Paul uses about putting on the armor of God and what we're doing. But, but Peter says here, arm yourself with that attitude in this case. Set your mind for the reality that this is going to be a struggle. And you might need to prepare yourself to suffer. And if you're going to go into that battle, you need to be ready. So prepare yourself, arm yourself, get ready. But what happens then? Peter says, if, if you arm yourself and if you do suffer for your faith, that's really what we've been talking about through First Peter. If you suffer for your faith or for doing good, what's the result of that? It's surprising. Peter says, whoever does this, whoever arms themselves is ready, they go through it. When they suffer, they're done with sin. There's a lot of theological debate in the commentaries about what does this phrase mean, a lot of technical jargon and this and that. And, but I think Peter actually makes it pretty clear what he means by the next sentence. He's, he's following the same thought. He's explaining it. What does it mean to be done with sin? It means you're not living any longer for your base human desires, the things of the old program, the old cartridge, the old software, but you, you have changed to a new set of desires. You, you desire to please God with your life. There's a new set of directives that you are, are now acting on. But you're done with sin. And, and when we think of that, it's sort of counterintuitive a little bit, isn't it? Because normally when you suffer for doing something, the usual effect is you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, from the dumb things that we do, like stepping on a rake, and the things that we do socially, when, things that we suffer for, sometimes even in our own hands, we say, well, I'm not going to do that again. Why would I ever do that again? But Peter says here, no, for the believer, when you suffer in your body, it has a different effect. It has a purifying effect. It has a focusing effect on your faith. And somehow you say, you know what? I'm done forever with the old program now. I only want to live for the new things that God has for me and his new calling on my life. Why would that be? I think that's a really interesting dynamic at work there. And I think as we look at the testimonies of people that have suffered, we, we get a clue into how that works for us as believers. I think a key part of it is when we suffer in the body, a, a brothers and sisters will testify, they have an experience of Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, in his presence that is so deep in a way that they have never experienced before. The grace and the presence of God comes to the believer when we suffer. And once they have experienced that, they don't want to go back to a lesser experience of who God is. They say, give me more of that. So that's God and his grace toward us when we suffer. I think the other effect is that you realize when you suffer that nobody, nobody really can ultimately hurt you as one who belongs to Christ. They can make it painful for you. They can make it bad for you, but they can't ever take away or rob you of your relationship with God, the joy that you experience in that, and the hope that you have for eternity in that. And when you suffer, that crystallizes that and clarifies that so well. And you realize, you know what? Ultimately, I can't be hurt. And somehow, that brings it home. That makes sense uh, when we see even the examples of uh, other believers in Scripture, doesn't it? Paul and Silas, beaten, thrown in jail in the Philippian jail. And then at midnight, they're singing hymns and praise to God. I don't think that they were putting on an act in that. I think that they were singing with the joy of knowing the Lord and experiencing the presence of Christ with them in that prison. That wasn't a, that wasn't a put on as people heard them singing. And then the, uh, the apostles, early in the life of the church, they were brought in by the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jewish people. And they said, you have to stop preaching and proclaiming resurrection in the name of Jesus in this town. You're filling this town with your teaching. Stop doing that. 
And then they had them flogged and they let them go. And on the way home, they didn't feel sorry for themselves. What did it say? They went on their way rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. They rejoiced in that. I, I don't have that. I haven't experienced that, but I see the testimony of the early church and the testimony of believers around the world today. And I, I believe what they tell us is true, that experience of Christ is so valuable to them that they would not trade it. The fear of suffering goes away in that. It's a quote from a Christian brother in, in Kashmir, difficult place of the world between India and Pakistan, currently under the control of India, I believe, but a difficult place to become a Christian. Different religious influences in that part of the world, Hindu nationalism. And so this, this brother became a believer in that setting and he was beaten for his faith by the friends that he used to hang out with, share life with. And this is what he said about his persecution. Without persecution, you have a lot to fear. I think he means sort of the anxiety of the unknown, what could happen. But he says, but after persecution, you don't have to fear. It's because I saw Christ in persecution. I saw Christ in the persecution. He gave me a way out in his presence. Amazing testimony. We need to pray for these brothers and sisters that go through that. But he says, you don't have to fear. I saw Christ in that persecution. We do have to ask ourselves, in some way, are we, are we moving toward that in our own culture? I think we have a sense, maybe, that, that pressure on faith, pressure on believers in the public sphere is increasing. Maybe you've experienced that, maybe a little bit uh, lightly compared to, to what these brothers and sisters experience. But maybe some, some mocking in the workplace. There's, there's times when people are sort of held back from promotion, or they know that the public opinion in their, in their sphere is against them, maybe friends that don't really frequent you anymore after you decided to come to Christ. Some of us may have experienced that, but there are those that have experienced a higher level even in our own culture. And I think that's why it's important for when Peter says, arm yourselves, we know that as the world continues to move away from the things of God, that, that this is a likely possibility. So we need to take that, that very seriously, that instruction, arm yourselves with the same attitude. I was reading just recently an example of this in our own country with, uh, some of you might be familiar with the story of Baker Jack Phillips out in Colorado. And this man has, has been persecuted for 12 years intentionally, intentionally targeted. He's a baker, makes great cakes, pastries, renowned for his baking, but he's been intentionally targeted because he won't adorn those cakes with messages that are antithetical to his faith. Mind you, it's, it's not that he won't bake a cake. He'll, ba he'll bake a cake for anybody. He doesn't, it doesn't concern him what their status is, any of that. He'll bake a cake, but he won't put a message on a cake that expresses something contrary to what he wants to celebrate through his faith in Christ. So he's been intentionally targeted, and he's been under lawsuit for 12 years with this. He just won another victory in court, but it may not be over yet. It may not be the final word yet. But can you imagine... 12 years of being targeted with lawsuits and the time and the effort spent in that, the money that's been devoted to that, the time from your family. I can't imagine the, the anxiety, some of the anxiety and the sleepless nights that Jack Phillips has been through as he works through this. Am I going to lose my business? Am I doing the right thing? What are, we, what are we doing here, Lord? So pray for brothers and sisters like this that go through this. And that may well be an indicator of things to come. But, but pray for Jack as he continues to fight. And in doing so, he upholds our freedom of expression that we have in this country as well. So that protects us as well. But that is persecution. And our, our family of God around the world experiences that in greater measure than that. And so let's arm up. We need to arm ourselves. We need to get ready and prepare for what could be because Peter says it's going to be difficult. If you're going to try to follow the new program in your life, internally and externally, there's going to be pressure and it's going to be hard. Let's consider the, the ways of the old program here for a moment, the old cartridge, and just be, be grateful when we think about where some of us have come from as believers, that we don't have to run that software anymore in our lives. I know some of us have been rescued from, from some of those things that are hard to speak of. And 
But some of us have experienced that. And then the grace of Christ has come in and freed us from those things. And Peter would say, and the other writers of the New Testament, if there are any part of those things that we're still involved in that are still clinging to us, the old person is always right there. That's the internal pressure to go back to running the old program. He says, leave that behind. It's time for a change. Time to put those things away and run the new program. And if you suffer for that, then your perspective will be cemented in that. You'll live for the will of God. But thank God that he's taken us out of some of those things. Because it's, it's hard. It's hard to change, isn't it? It's hard to change your life. It's hard to change your lifestyle, what, you're, what your life has always been about. And then there's the external pressure that comes to us as well. There's the external pressure and this abuse that comes because the world around us that's still immersed in the old program says, why are you doing things differently? You're making us uncomfortable because you won't live the way that we live. Have you, ever, have you felt that ever as a believer? I've felt it. I think back to my days in college, my days as, as a young man. And uh, for some reason, I don't understand why, there was always this pressure from the people around me that really, really indulged heavily in alcohol, and they always wanted me to join in on that. And I didn't. I, I had a little bit of a secret weapon in that I really don't like it. <laughs> I don't like alcohol, so I was like, I could, I could take it or leave I don't need it. I don't want it. And plus, I thought I always seemed to be having more fun than the people around me who were overindulging. And so I was like, why would I do that? But there's always this pressure like, oh man, you gotta come on. Why aren't you doing this? Have some of this, join us in this. And I was glad to have those friendships, but that pressure was always there. And I think that is kind of indicative of the way that the world around us looks at us sometimes. Why aren't you doing this? You know, this is fun. I had somebody tell me one time, you don't drink, that's not healthy. <laughs> Why aren't you joining in with us on this? Well, it's because we've been given a different perspective now. We've been given a new set of things to value and pursue and, and a new set of relationships and a relationship with the living God. But often our culture doesn't like that. And that starts to bear suspicion and that brings about mockery and sometimes that can bring about greater and greater kinds of abuse. And I'm concerned for our own culture and society because when I see cultures that have stepped away from, increasingly from civility, then things can get bad really quickly. And they can get bad for believers very quickly. And we look around the world again and we see that. Another quote from a, a friend of, of the first brother that I, I, I just read to you, his, what he said about persecution. His friend was one of the people that when he, the other guy became a Christian, he turned against him and participated, he took part in the beatings of his former friend because he'd become a Christian. Well, then in God's grace, he became a Christian after some time, and I, I'm sure he regretted that immeasurably, but he became a Christian, and now he's concerned with persecution that may come, but he said this about it. This is his view. When his family finds out and his friends that he's now a believer in Christ, he said, they could either kick me out of the house or disown me. They could beat me up. The people I used to associate with might even kill me. There is a danger, but there is no fear. The maximum that I can expect is martyrdom. That's a courageous stance, isn't it? That's somebody who's had their perspective flipped. The maximum they can do to me, the, only, the, the worst thing they could do to me is kill me. And that's not very scary because I belong to Christ. How many of us could say that with him? But that's the end of it. He realized, you know, there's nothing else that I can lose or they can take away from me. And if they kill me, well then, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So that's the peace that he's made with the suffering that may come to him. But that's what cultures can do, will do. And so Peter says, get ready, arm yourselves with the attitude of Christ in this. There's a, there's a key, as we've talked about the history of the background of the letter of 1 Peter, I, I think that tells us something of the kind of abuse that those believers uh, in, in the early church in Northern Asia Minor were experiencing. And there has been that speculation, was, was the persecution at this point, was it official? Was it from the empire? Was it social? And depending on when you, know, you think the, the letter was actually written, there might have been some official persecution happening. But we certainly see that there was social pressure and persecution happening as Peter addresses this. People around you, they're wondering, why don't you plunge into this? The same reckless and wild living. Some of your translations might say this flood of dissipation, purposelessness, spending your energy on things that are meaningless. 
So we see that as Christians, and we know that that might come. So Peter says, get ready. But he gives a word of encouragement here too. He says, but your persecutors, the pagans who are without God, not interested, they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's part of why we came to Christ initially, isn't it? Because we recognize there is an accountability coming. There is a God who made the heavens and the earth and everything in them, and he will call each person to account, and he will judge the living, who are living now, those who have died. We will all stand before him. And for those who have engaged in purposeless and meaningless living without God and without, without Christ, that's a frightening picture of what is to come and that accountability. But we praise God that we've understood by his grace that there is a salvation and a rescue from that. And in coming to Christ, we have the hope of a different outcome for eternity. We have the hope of a relationship with God and the fellowship of his people forever. So that's an ominous, ominous word, but it's encouraging for us. And then Peter goes on and says, that's why the gospel was preached previously, even to those who, have now, who are now dead. And Rob, Pastor Rob went into that a little bit last week with the, that complicated passage about Noah. But Peter says, look, you, there's accountability coming, but you have hope. You don't, don't run the old program. And as Paul would echo the apostle Paul, where he says, those who sow to please the old nature of the flesh, they only reap destruction and death in the end. But those who sow to please the Spirit reap joy and eternal life. Those are the differences in the programs and their outcomes. So the old program, it's time, time to switch, time to change it. Let's look at some of the things of the new program and what that consists of. Peter goes on again, he says, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert, sober, so you can pray. And then he goes on and gives these other instructions about what our actions are to look like as we run the new program that God has given us. I just want to mention about this phrase he uses, the end of all things is near. You know, Peter, early church, uh, he and the others in the early church, they still had the perspective. They, they didn't know exactly when Christ was coming back, but they had the perspective that it could be any time. And they knew that they were living in the final age, the final age of human earthly history. We are still in that same position. We don't know when Christ is coming back. We know that we're living in the final age of human history. We do know we're, we must be closer now than Peter was. 2,000 years have gone by, so we're getting closer. How close are we? Sometimes it feels like maybe we're getting pretty close. But God has always wanted his church to have a sense of imminence. And even as Jesus taught his disciples, he said, don't get sleepy. Don't be distracted by the things in the world. Watch, pray, stay alert, stay sober. That's the consistent message in the New Testament because you don't know when I'm coming back. So don't be lulled into complacency. God wants his people to have a sense of imminence that it could happen at any time. And we who live in the light, we, we can see the season change and we're not to be surprised. We're not to be taken by surprise by that and unprepared. All of those parables that speak to that, the master returning and finding the servants. Are they doing the job? Or are they not doing the job? Did they invest well? Did they not invest well? What are the outcomes of those stories? So get ready. The time is near. The end of all things is near. And Peter's connecting that in the previous section. You know, he's just talked about there's coming accountability. Those, those thoughts run together. They work together. The judge is at the door. The end of all things is near. So stay alert. Here it is again. Be of sober mind so that you may pray so that you can relate to God as these things develop. And we look at that and we see, the, uh, we see in that passage the components of the new program. If we break that down, it starts with prayer and, and being alert and not letting things come into our lives that hinder our prayers. And then he says, love each other deeply in the church. Offer hospitality to one another. Meet each other's needs within the church. Serve with the gifts that God has given you. We're going to go into those a little bit more in just a moment, but if you think about it, I think you can see the difference between the old program and the new program, can't you? The old program, all of those acts in the old program are motivated out of a sense of elevating yourself, pleasing yourself. They're all based in self, protecting yourself, medicating yourself. The self is at the, the center of all of those things that, that Peter talks about debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. In fact, these are the characteristics of people who 
life is quite hopeless in the end if you're living that way. Because first of all, you start just to please yourself and then you get involved in these things to, to medicate yourself because you have a sense of there, life is meaningless. If you're not connected to the creator, you have no purpose, really. You have no hope and people come to recognize this. So let's get all we can for ourselves right now. But you see the destructiveness of the attitudes of the old program because there's nothing in these things that elevates another person, is there? In fact, all these things do is they objectify another person, other people, and they make them ends for your own selfish means. That's what characterizes the acts and behaviors and attitudes of the old program. And even in idolatry, which I have seen practiced in every part of the world, idolatry is merely seeking to cement uh, prosperity for myself, to appease what gods and please what gods there may be in the hope that things will go better for myself and my life will be better. So it all stems in this basic love and continued elevation of self that ultimately leads to an empty future. Self-fulfillment in the end leads nowhere beyond this short time on the planet. But for the new program, for us as believers, there's a whole different set of attitudes and behaviors and they're all focused outside of ourselves. This is the gift and a blessing that God calls us to as we walk in faith with him. All the acts and motives of the new program are grounded in relationship. Not the old way of self-seeking, but they're grounded in relationship and seeking the best interest of other people, other people outside the church, other people within the church. And those practices start, as we, as we look again, those practices start with prayer. They're rooted in prayer, which is a wholesale shift in perspective of how the universe works. When we start to relate to the creator who is holy, which means he is separate completely from ourselves. And we pursue relationship with him. What a gift to be able to say that, that we can pursue relationship with the creator who is wholly other than us, but divine. That's a complete perspective change from the world is only about and for me. And so Peter says, stay alert, walk in faith, be sober so you can pray because it begins there, and then it goes forward. Love each other deeply. Your brothers and sisters, God has called you into the church. Love deeply, and it covers over a multitude of sins. That's another uh, little phrase that's been much talked about, but I think we find the answer to what that means in the death of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his self-sacrifice, he paid for, he covered, he removed our sins, and he took away the sin that was a barrier to our relationship with him in his death. In the same way, we're called in the church, in this, this unity that we're called to, this fellowship that we're called to, when we love deeply, we're able to say, you know what, in the ways that we sometimes offend each other and rub each other wrong, we're going to put those things aside. We're going to cover over them. We're going to love beyond that. And, and that's what keeps those hurts and those resentments from developing into faction and outright battle of the wills. Love deeply in the church. It covers over a multitude of sins. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some things sometimes that need to be dealt with and dealt with within the church. But we all, we all offend each other in many ways. We all hurt each other in many ways. And, and Peter is saying, in many of those things, love deeply with the love of Christ. And forgiveness and unity continues to flow when we do that. And then he says, offer hospitality to each other. You know, in, in Peter's time, there were Christians traveling all over the world doing business. There were preachers and evangelists and coming to town and leaving. And so the idea was very practical. Peter's saying, put those people up, house them, give them a place of peace, take care of their needs. And so that dynamic isn't quite so much at work today, but I, the idea still applies to us. When you see a brother and sister in the congregation with needs, take care of those needs. Look out for their best interest. Again, all of these things oriented toward the other. And then he says, he talks about serving, his final point. And he says, you know, God has granted you gifts to serve the body with. And I think he's echoing, again, the words of Paul about spiritual gifts and how the Holy Spirit has apportioned those. Peter says, in its various forms of grace. You know, some scholars think Paul and Peter might have been working off each other's notes. <gasps> some people find some sort of scandal in that. I don't know if they were, but I know this, they knew the same Savior. 
that we're working off the same relationship with God, so it's totally unsurprising to me that they talk about the same ideas. They encourage us in the same ways. I think they loved each other deeply. But he says, whatever gift you've received is faithful stewards of God's grace, these gifts that are to be used in the church. So if God has appointed you to speak, to teach, to prophesy, then do that with the knowledge that those words are as valuable as words God himself has given. And so lean into the value of those things and pursue that with such value. The gifts that you have to serve, pursue it wholeheartedly. God hasn't given his gifts idly or without purpose. So Peter says, this is what it's for, this is what it's about. Lean into these things where God has designed us to serve each other. And in doing that, the wisdom of God is made known in the church. Not just to us, but the New Testament, it's it's clear. The wisdom of God is made manifest to those outside the church and even to the powers in the heavens. The wisdom of God seen in the church as we love and serve each other. That is a beautiful thing. That's a completely different program. And Peter says, lean into that with all the energy that you can muster, and it begins with prayer. It begins with your proper orientation and your relationship with God, and we need more of that. The second thing that's different, the other thing that's different about the new program is the results that happen. Peter's already said the results of the first, running the first program in your life, they lead nowhere. They lead to judgment. They lead to final accountability in a way that's that's not going to be welcome. But running the new program, what does it lead? It leads to Christ being glorified in our lives. So that when we do these things in all things, God is praised through Jesus Christ. To him, to the Savior, to the Redeemer, to him be glory forever and ever. That's the perspective that grounds us when we're running the new program. Not self, but for the glory of God. The old program only results in condemnation. But the new program results in glorification. And I hope that Our hearts are alive with a desire to see Christ glorified, to see his name exalted. And when we adopt the practices and attitudes of the new program, that will happen in the world and in the heavens. It's an amazing result. Well, I hope you've been encouraged this morning to see the two perspectives that Peter is offering here and saying, look, for the Christian, get ready. If you're going to leave behind the old program, it's going to come with its challenges and its actual dangers. But it's so worth it when you switch cartridges and you run the new program and you start living outside of yourself, it's a whole different kind of focus on your relationship with God and other people. And it leads to such tremendous reward and joy. As I thought about this, this made me think of, of a friend of mine uh, that I grew up with, good friends. Um, watched his life, we went to different places for college, his wasn't as good, but you know, we, we remained friends even when we beat them in football and everything. And uh, my friend, uh, he got into trouble uh, out, of, out of school, got married, had a couple kids, and, and he got into trouble in his marriage relationship, and things were not going well. They were not going well. I thought I'd be able to talk about this and be fine, but man, <laughs> these are real people to me. And my friend, uh, he had professed faith in Christ as a kid, and we had done some church stuff together, gone to Awana Club together, but he'd kind of moved away from that in his, his young adult life. But when his marriage started getting messed up, he was looking for answers, and he started to go back to church. Started to go to the men's group. Started to be reminded of all those things that God calls us to in marriage. And his life began to change, and he began to go home and look after the needs of his wife and to serve her interests and to honor her. And after a while, she said, she noticed. (laughs) Surprise, surprise, she noticed. And she was like, what is going on here? What is going on with you? And she started going to church. And she became a believer. And they stayed happily married. I'm happy for my friend. He had some tough stuff in his life as a kid. But that's the perfect illustration of what it means to run the new program. 
He got his focus off of himself and only his needs. And he said, through Christ, I'm going to put this focus on my wife where it belongs. And it transformed their life, their lives. And so I say to you this morning, are you stuck? Are you hurting? Are you in a place where life is miserable? Maybe you're not engaging in some of those acts of the old program that Peter talked about, but maybe there's some of that still clinging to you. I don't know. But God invites you to say, I'm going to put aside those things. I'm going to reorient my perspective on my relationship with God, and I'm going to pursue a life in meeting the needs of others outside and inside the church. That's the way forward. That's the blessing that God offers us in the new program. So if you need help in those things, then we would love to, to talk to you about that. If you haven't met Christ and you don't quite know what I'm talking about, we would love to talk to you about that. There's a whole different life awaiting you in Christ when you give yourself to him. There's a whole new program. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are that good. You are that good to us that you would come into our mess and our self-centeredness and say, I will rescue you from that misery that you keep pursuing. And in Christ, you've done that. You've freed us from those things. You've, you've given us the power to say no to sin. And you've invited us, not only that, you've invited us into a new kind of life, a new kind of living with new perspectives and attitudes and joy and hope and a relationship with you and the people around us. So help us to think deeply about that, the ways we might be running the old program and where you're calling us to live into the new program and to seek that. And I pray that that would be transforming for us this week as we carry forward. We thank you, Jesus, for the newness that you offer us, and we pray that you would hear and accept our worship this morning as we call upon you together. We ask these things through your powerful name. Amen.